I love online because it's like, I guess, as everybody says, like, I'm not that teacher that says, oh, I love because you can teach in your pajamas, but it's just fun. <laughs> okay, and here we are. So Amber Clayton, um, thank you so much for coming. Um, when you reached out to me, I immediately recognized your face. Uh, not your face, your name, actually, but it's good to put a face to a name now. So if you wouldn't mind, would you just uh, present yourself, introduce yourself to people watching? Please? Yeah, sure. So my name is Amber. Um, I actually uh, am a community tutor on italki. Um, so originally I'm from California, I'm, but I'm living here in Las Vegas and I'm not quite sure what to say. I guess I'll give an interesting fact. I'm very creative, so I spend a lot of my time either browsing YouTube to learn how to teach better or to paint something like this, so. Okay, great, excellent. And all of the other details about, well, not all of the details, but enough details about your teaching will come out in the interview. So that's a great okay. start. Since okay. you brought up a uh, painting, let's see, do you think that your creativity and your artistic kind of touch do you think that ever helps you in your uh, pedagogy as a teacher? Most definitely. Um, I'll say that I'm very, I guess being, uh, I like to kind of do things outside of the box because each student is different. So, you know, whether it's maybe trying to create like a little creative worksheet for a learner that's not as focused or, um, I think being creative kind of causes you to be able to do things at the last minute too, just think quick. So that a lot of that comes out with my students. Sometimes it's like, oh, you want to cover this? Okay, well, how can we use this in a scenario? And, you know, I, I'd say it's kind of like this. Yeah, like thinking on your feet is a very important part of the job, right? And some of the best ideas come, honestly, when I'm in classes. So for example, I try to... I tried to integrate a new activity or try something new each time I teach. So I'll have 90% of what I already know, what I've done before, what I know works, and then 10% something new or maybe 20% something new, mm -hmm. um, a ratio like that. How about you? What would you say your ratio is? Like when you're going through italki, um, in terms of how much of a risk you would be willing to take and how many kind of new activities, new digital tools you'd be willing to try. Would you say that you have a similar kind of ratio to me or is it a little bit different? Um, as far as digital tools, if you're referring to things kind of like YouTube and things like that, I do use that now. I'm not so, um, as I'm still trying to develop you know, my ideas, I have plans of how to like make my lessons uh, more creative, but um, I don't know, at the moment I'm doing conversation lessons. So after the conversation, I, I try not to be such a structured teacher, like, oh, you have to read such a formal article, but it's like, hey, let's listen to a vlogger. Let's listen to the casual talk because that's your aim. So you kind of have to look at those things for students, you know? That's so cool. All right, sweet. So um, do you have any like go to vloggers or websites that because a lot of people watching are probably community tutors or people who have this kind of laid back like italki in a nutshell, it, it's uh, one of the things that distinguishes it is that it is known for the laid back style of a lot of teachers. Do you have any suggestions for resources? Um, yeah, well, okay, for me, I like to go, uh, I guess if you're generally just trying to pick up vocabulary, you know, and you don't want to just get a list of idioms, I recommend a couple of YouTube channels um, from people who teach it. I, wa I, I watch them as I send my students. So there's <laughs> one called, I think it's MMM English, mm, something like yes. this. Mm -hmm. um, well, there's so many. Yeah. Yeah, but um, speaking of two, uh, a lot of students have difficulties with phrasal verbs. And mm -hmm. if you're trying to enforce those and really help them, I would use phrasal verb demon. I just came across that. So they have a list of like, you let's say you type in the phrasal verb hang out, they'll get they'll give you 
ex uh, sentence examples and like the collocations and those are so helpful. Oh, that's awesome. That's actually really like a real coincidence because I always say to my students that prepositions are invented by the devil and that they're kind of evil because they're all over the place and it's hard, it could be hard to learn rules. So the fact that it's called phrasal verb demon is kind of fitting, but, um, but that's good. Anything that can make things easier uh, for students is, is really useful and phrasal verbs. I mean, that's one of the go-tos, right? Especially with a lot of students on italki being in that kind of intermediate range um, and phrasal verbs, though, those are, that's one of the areas where they could really take their language up a notch. So that's excellent. Um, all right, uh, so there's so much to talk about, like you are a community tutor, um, maybe could you tell us a little bit more about just your teaching background in general, and how you fit into italki when you started on italki? Yeah, well, actually, it was like a real start for me on italki because I came from uh, working for a China based company. Or Chinese based company. So working with kids and just kind of being fun and now all of a sudden having to talk to adults, which it's not difficult, but it's like, okay, um, you know, and just kind of learning because like for me, the biggest thing is like integrating uh, questions and things like that based on the culture and the residency of the student. Because for example, you might have an American uh, a student who is living in, a, in in the U.S. and maybe they're trying to get their green card and they're getting used to the culture. So maybe you're going to teach them more specific terms instead of like stuff that, you know, just casual talk. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I went from kids to adults. And, you know, at the beginning, it was very overwhelming. I was getting booked like crazy um, as a new tutor and trying to have conversations with students and I think probably within my by my second month second or third it's finally like okay I, I got this down you know <laughs> yeah. but keep track of your questions you know when you're starting out keep track of your ideas because you know what I mean like those are actually that's building your curriculum later down the line so for sure yeah d definitely definitely and if you use something then you and it works and you throw it out then it's it, it, yeah it's better to just keep track of it for sure um actually i'm going to be one of the first the first teacher in this series who i interviewed he actually suggested that i'd make uh something pretty uh on canva which is like my home uh, at this point and uh, make something pretty like a uh, kind of lesson layout right so hopefully i could integrate something that makes this easier for teachers to to mm -hmm. uh to you know add in some of their new fresh resources and by the way uh right before this meeting amber was asking me why i decided to do this and one of the reasons why is exactly what you just brought up you talking about teaching kids like for me, I'm not, a, I don't really like teaching kids, actually. Um, I prefer adults. So getting other teachers' perspectives is like super, super useful right here. Um, so in terms of teaching kids versus teaching adults, which one do you prefer more at this point or both? If it's with a curriculum, I love kids. You know, I get, t I get students um, all the time or parents all the time, like, and they're like, can you teach my kid? And it's like, you know, if I had like the curriculum that I used to have when I was working for that company, most definitely. But it's hard because it's like, mm, it's just, it just, it's trying to fill like a 30 minute time, you know? But I, I would say at this point, adults, because it's adding to experience that's necessary. And also it's shifting my perspective in so many ways. So I have like personal growth you know i love it so helpful awesome so uh it's uh yeah it's necessary so why is it necessary like moving forward do you have any plans to specifically teach adults or do you think you'll get um into a classroom one day and teach kids yeah good question you know i have experience working with kids in person but not in an english setting um but i think i think i'm gonna 
do like launch my own virtual, mm, I'm not quite sure what's going to be yet, but I have ideas of really trying to make my own platform. Um, just trying to help students, you know, I see my students coming in all the time and they're like, you know, they're telling you their, their difficulties. And I'm, my aim is like, how can I make this virtual, like a virtual learning experience, you know? Mm. So I'd love to do in person. Maybe I'll do something for like expats here in Las Vegas, you know, some immersion stuff. I don't know yet. All right. The sky's the limit. Well, when that happens, mm -hmm. let us know and I'll put it, who knows, maybe if someone's watching this three, four years down the road, ever has her platform up, but we, we, we have no way of knowing. So if you ever do uh, launch something, definitely let us know. And I know you're not the only person I've spoken to who has big dreams for uh, the potential of the future. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I really fell in love with uh, the, with, online learning as a learner and as a teacher actually mm -hmm. but this is a hot topic um some people really prefer to be inside the class so i don't think i've asked you specifically yet do you prefer teaching online or do you prefer teaching in the class um i love online because it's like i guess as everybody says like i'm not that teacher that says oh i love because you can teach in your pajamas but it's just fun <laughs> because for me i've already traveled like and i i just went somewhere this week and i was able to go through with my plans instead of no i you know so i like that and um yeah I, and then you know you don't have to cut your work short you you can just teach as you go if you're a go-getter in that sense so yeah exactly yeah well for me it um yeah yeah it's not the uh pajama cliche either um i feel i feel comfortable even if i'm like in a dress shirt right but um but for me it's more about um you know not having the commutes as well not just for me but for my students as well a lot of them are a lot more uh, comfortable uh learning from home the students that i do have and uh you know in terms of time as well i mean if i have to take like a one and a half hour bus somewhere and back that's three hours out of my day right and you know for us who are teaching online mm -hmm. it could be tough to uh get 50 hours in and make uh as much money as we need to and fit all the lessons in in the correct way so uh so it could make a big difference not having that commute i find uh, yeah. just to add to the list of um, of pros of teaching at home. But of course, there are cons to it as yeah. well. Yeah, if I can kind of add like a pro and a con, I, I think like other than the usual stuff, you know, one of the cons can be if you're living in an English speaking country, um, you know, classes might be more expensive in person. Um, I've, I've looked into a few things at a library and, you know, they want when I was starting out on italki, you know, I, I had the kid experience, but not the adult teaching experience. So the years of teaching, you know, I couldn't match that. And so, you know, and maybe the con of working online is if you're working um, in for countries where the currencies are a little bit lower, it, it could affect like you, you don't want to raise your price as you would do, you know, here, like in the place you live. So there's always something. That's but. fair, Amber. Yeah. Well, I'm speaking to a fellow North American for the first time this uh, this week, and I think the only time in this whole series. So, um, you know, there's utility in speaking to non-native English speakers and native Eng English speakers, because, I mean, for me, I had mm -hmm. to uh, kind of relearn a lot of grammar um, as a teacher, especially on italki, because a lot of these students come prepared. And it is one on one. <laughs> so if you like, if you sometimes, uh, and I'm not trying to scare people because, you know, some teachers do ask me and they're very apprehensive. What happens if I don't know something? Um, I've spoken about it in other videos to, you know, be honest and, um, and just try your best to improve every class. But there are some situations where I hear a phrase and I'm just like, is that is that British English? Like, does that exist? <laughs> or or yes. is that not what, what's usually said at all, right? So there, there is some Googling that's involved, some, uh, you know, learning grammar. I had to learn all the ins and outs all over again, right? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder, could you speak on this a little bit? Uh, were there any kind of uh, growing pains for you to relearn aspects of the language as a native speaker? Oh my gosh, I feel like all the time because I find myself you know, you obviously speak slower in classes or you try to just be a little, I guess, be a, more, a little more polite. So it's like your language is definitely affected. Um, and I think that's something that you have to learn how to overcome because, you know, you don't want your students to miss out on the native side of it, as I like to focus more on. So I think most definitely there's so many growing pains. There's like you know, the difference, but you know, you have a student come in and they have phrases and you're like, I don't know English, I don't know this. But then you look it up and it was really British English or maybe something from Canada. Um, I say too, like, let's see, um, I don't deal too much with the pronunciation issues like between British English and American, because usually you can pick up on that. But um, let me see. Oh, I had it. Yeah. I'm constant. I'll just say I'm constantly Googling grammar, but I try, I try to have those saved already because along with the grammar, I also, you also should put in a little bit of exercise with the students, with the questions you're studying present perfect, try to test them with some of that. Don't make it too formal or you, mm. you know, you throw them off. So. Good. Yeah. Okay. Um, as an, Okay, as an American uh, teaching on italki, there are many American teachers. I wonder, have there has there ever been a situation where you have felt American <laughs> on the platform? And by that, that could even be like as you're talking about with the green card, right? Like you, like for example, me being a Canadian, a lot of my students want to immigrate to Canada. A lot of them look at me like I'm like a tour guide, or a, I'm like a. Uh, an immigration consultant or something like that. Like I know the ins and outs of immigration and honestly, I don't. And I, I tell them that, but luckily I've learned a lot more about the process. That's useful for me and for my students. Mm -hmm. But you know, that has kind of made me feel like, just like kind of like, um, I guess, emphasize my identity as a Canadian. The fact that they look at me as like this kind, of, some of them look at me as almost like a, yeah, like a travel agent, right? So I wonder in any way, it could be that way or a different way. Have you ever felt really American <laughs> as a teacher? Yeah. Well, I would say, I would say more so definitely like feeling like my students speak better than I do. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I speak so informal and having to switch those modes. Secondly, mm -hmm. I would say uh, sometimes the questions that you ask, you know, respective questions, but culturally speaking, you know, like, um, I mean, I have I have two two types of students. A lot of my students are uh, based here in the U.S. Maybe they've lived here for a while and they're doing practice. So maybe you know conversations with them about you know typical American culture things they can relate to a little more. But you know when I'm speaking with um, some of my students, I have my other students worldwide. I have to choose my questions wisely because I find sometimes my students are like, oh, I. I don't know, or we don't have that here. No, I, that never happened. And I'm like, my question's kind of strange, but I don't know. So that's learning, learning for me yeah. too. Exactly. Oh, what did you study in a university, by the way, if you went to college or university? What did you study? Yeah, good question. Um, so one of my degrees is, uh, I got a degree, uh, it was Christian ministry because I was working in a church and something like that. My other degree I got in uh, the Spanish language. Uh, it's like a, I guess, it, I guess it's one of those like associate degrees you can get, you know, to fill. But I didn't, I didn't follow through because the method of learning. So that, I think that was a good experience. Probably now I can see, I reflect on that as a teacher. Like, I'm not going to teach like how I learned here. Most definitely. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of, um, a lot of the students who are on italki are perfectly fine with having a teacher with a different teaching style as well right and that's actually like um, that's a little bit of a pivot and an adaptation for them because they grew up with uh teachers with one 
teaching style, especially a lot of my Russian students tell me about this. And uh, some of my uh, students from East Asia have little to no speaking practice in classes. So talk about different, then they sit down with a Canadian in class, right? So, um, so yeah, so hearkening back to uh, what we were talking about before, I asked you what your degree was because my um because you were talking about this kind of like cultural difference this cultural gap and i find that since i studied politics and english literature and like the humanities and social sciences sometimes mm -hmm. i i would ask my students about these things like not about politics but i would ask them like more kind of like social studies -y, like ask like uh for, like uh, I'd look at a topic from like the social studies angle right like just from my bias because that's my like that's my uh, knowledge base and a lot of my students would kind of be like I don't care <laughs> right yeah. like I like that side of it I don't care about I care more about like um, you know like maybe in a certain situation like more of a practical or a scientific like a natural science side right okay. so um, yeah yeah so so you did a uh, you did pr pursue at least a um a an associate degree in Spanish. Do you speak Spanish and do you ever speak it in class? Um let's see. So I I I do speak now because I because of the way I learned and I wasn't motivated. You know, I didn't get motivated to learn to to start really relearning and growing in the Spanish language until I learned it in language learned um with people in the language apps so that actually if we're talking about the cultural side of stuff that's added to being a teacher i think those language apps prepared for that but i um i don't really use it with my students i think it's uh, i have more of my most of my students they prefer being immersed in the language so if i do ever have to translate you know, if I hear them say a word, it comes in handy to translate it really quick and be like, oh, I know what you're saying, because I know that word, but not too yeah. frequently. Okay, nice. Okay, yeah. good. good stuff. Um, have you taken any Spanish lessons on italki? Have you taken any lessons in like of any language as a student on italki? Yeah, you know, I, I took a couple in Spanish. Um, I don't, I haven't taken conversation because I'm not quite there yet for the verbal part, but um, mostly like maybe a grammar, but I have been, I, I know like there's probably two different languages that like I, I tried to start with and I never went through. I was really interested in Arabic a couple of years ago. So I did take two of those to start. And I did take a, a class for like an Indian language, one of the languages in India. Um, it's Malayalam and that's South India. So and my friend's from there. So that's how that kind of started. Excellent. So this is actually, I've taken conversational lessons. I, uh, I've at least been at that mm -hmm. point. Uh, luckily, I've taken conversational lessons in six lang languages on italki, and my skills have definitely <laughs> have definitely gone downhill since then because you know life happens and you get busy. But I'm trying to brush up on my Spanish again. But I just want to. Um, I have thought about taking a Russian class, an Arabic class, and I'm not. Com I I've never been conversational to that conversational point in either of those languages. So I just wonder how step by step what was the process of you actually booking these classes where they are basically i guess they're teaching you in english but they're teaching you aspects mm -hmm. of their language um so did you kind of warn your teacher about that beforehand did you say hi just to let you know i can't uh speak megalam or uh, or arabic at a conversational level i just want to know a little bit about it or did you just uh, book the class and show up? Yeah, well, I per like contrary to my to what my some of my students do, where you have to reach out. I always reach out to the teacher first to be like, "Hey, I want to if I'm you know Spanish, I want conversational uh, or v pronunciation help because I like to know because you know." Um, be when you're so into when you know your teaching style and then you're a learner you kind of have that expectation like i want them to teach me how i teach so i like to feel things out first and ask 
And usually they're always like, are you a beginner? It's like complete beginner. No problem. Cause they have a fluent level in your native language. So, you know, exactly. Great. Um, yeah. So are there any, uh, so could you walk us through what the Arabic lesson was like? Um, I guess at first you kind of introduce yourselves and then did they go through the different letters of Arabic with you or the different characters with you? Yeah. So um, when I did, when I did that, they mostly, my teacher mostly did the letters, you know, they might teach you like a phrase or two, you know, like, hello, how are you? I, I already kind of knew that. So I'm like, okay, what's next? But um, that's the hard, that's the hard thing when you're taking a language, in my opinion, of another script is like, they can teach you the sounds you might have to review with them, but most of the study, you know, it's going to be on your own. So, Great. but yeah. Uh, just, just another question or two, uh, really, we're sure. coming to the end of it. I think that we covered a lot. Um, I think for a lot of um, American teachers and or prospective American teachers and Canadian teachers, uh, this is going to be really useful, right? Because there is a massive amount of American teachers coming on to italki, right? Um, so I wonder if there was anything else that you just wanted to say to uh, the people who are watching before we finish up the interview, like anything else you expected mm -hmm. to talk about and we didn't talk about, for example? Sure. Well, one thing I wanna say, cause I found this very useful in my teaching. Um, I'm speaking more to people who are open to different teaching methods, you know, or like, don't be afraid to let your student voice their needs. So um, I have found that what keep other, what keeps my students coming back is that I, and they're always like, I really appreciated that you asked what I wanted. Um, because, you know, other than a grammar lesson, you come in and you, you have that part down, but you know, if they want conversation, see what they want to talk about, get to know their background. Um, I'd also say, be flexible with uh, teaching your students phrasal verbs and key phrases, because that's probably the majority of the reason why they do not know the English language is because they don't know those. And then I guess last thing I can say, uh, you know, if, if you have the ability to expose your students to other accents, videos, be, do that and, and teach them the emotion of the language, you know, so that they can speak properly and not so directly. All right. Thank you so much, Amber. If anybody's in, interested in taking an English language lesson, definitely check out Amber's profile. I'm going to put it right under here. Um, and if she has any social media, she'll give that to me as well. And maybe a few years down the road, she'll have a platform out as well. Who knows? Thank you, Amber. Thank you so much, Ryan. Appreciate it.